Hey, and welcome back to Inside the Pressure Cooker. My name is Chef Chad Kelly, and I know it's been a couple weeks uh, since we put anything out there. We've actually been in the process of working on some new formatting, and the reason for this is we've had some really great guests on, we've had some really great shows, and but unfortunately, we're only able to kind of hit the surface level of topics um, without having a show run hour and a half plus, which nobody really has the time for. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be revisiting some previous guests and we're going to be doing um, more of a host co-host kind of situation where we're going to be over the period of several weeks uh, producing episodes that will allow us to do a little bit of a deeper dive into the topic. Thank you for listening. Welcome back. Enjoy the show. All right, Josh. So kind of a new format, right? Where it's not necessarily chef interviews, so to speak. Um, It's more chef topics, current events, um, and and kind of uh, compare and contrasting, uh, talking various, um, you know, your perspective versus my perspective, right? Um, I've got, I'm much more of the old school um, chef mentality, the chef bringing, Um, you know, even in culinary school, when I was going to culinary school, I mean, I had the threat of 64 ounce ladles being thrown at me if I put my foot on the counter when I was chopping. Um, Yeah, I mean, I'm not even kidding. This was like the second week of school. You know, and being yelled at by big Austrian guys and French guys. And and that was just kind of my upbringing. Um, so obviously, <laughs> a lot of that has been ingrained in me um, in, in who I am. That's just kind of what I understand the industry to be. It's a very different world now. Uh, you grew up in this industry uh, with kind of a different perspective and um, in growing up. So the whole thing about this is going to be kind of talking the different perspectives. Yep. Right. All right. So topic at hand, art versus sustenance. 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 There you go. All right. <laughs> it's uh, it's just more fun to say it my way. Sustenance. It's like saying Worcestershire. 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 Yeah. Worcestershire. Um, I know they're all wrong and I don't care. <laughs> it's just fun. Um, so art versus sustenance, where do we want to go with this? Kick this off. It was just kind of a title to give it kind of a broad scope because, uh, you know, there's no telling where this conversation might go. No, no, no. idea started was recently I saw the menu. Have you seen the menu yet? I have not. All right. Well, it was like, it was marketed as like a horror movie when they were showing the previews, right? It's uh, yeah, they it, like it, they really kind of geared it towards like it was going to be a horror movie, and that movie is like it is hilarious, like, it is insanely funny. But the reason that it's so funny is because it pokes so much fun at fine dining while also like um, empathizing with the people that work there, okay. So a lot of the guests, like, I know you haven't seen the movie, but, I mean, they have a very short guest list. There's only 12 guests, and you kind of want them to die. (laughs) You kind of want bad things to happen to them just because they're just, like, rich assholes who don't really give a shit about food. They're they're just there for the exclusivity. And while I was talking about this movie with some friends at work... um, this other thing came up where um, you might remember this too. It was about a year ago. I think it was a little over a year ago. There was a chef in Italy. I think it was a Michelin starred restaurant who served a citrus foam in a (laughs) mold of his own mouth. And he didn't serve it (laughs) with utensils. He told the diner to lick the foam out out of the plaster mold. And it kind of spiraled into this conversation about like where does food end and art begin and vice versa. Well, and at what point is that art? And at what point of that is just kind of a fuck you to the guest? 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's like because cooking itself is is an art. It's a beautiful art. Um, you know, and it, it's it's a combination of art and science, right? Yeah. Um, you you really have to have a foot in both worlds. Um, unless you're in the pastry. Um, and at that point you're just, man, almost all science and doing lines of fucking all purpose flour in the back. I mean, it's, I, that's a, they're a whole nother breed. Um, yeah. So if you're a pastry person, you want to get on the show, defend yourself, hit me up. Mm. <laughs> um, God, I lost truck there. No, but I mean, in man, I, I mean, it, it's all an art, right? And but it's all about the guest. But at a certain point, like the guest starts to weigh on you as a chef, where you're just kind of that. You know what? Fine, I'm gonna do this, but it's just to kind of just to spite you. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh yeah, you want to see how far we can go with it? Here, fine, fuck you. <laughs> oh, now you want to bitch about it? Um, but then there's also like, was that chef so egotistical that, that he thought that was a good idea too? Yeah. Which which one is it? I don't know because it does seem kind of like a fuck you to the guest. And from like, if you're thinking about it just from a food perspective, that's pretty disgusting. (laughs) But if you're thinking about food as art and you want to push art into a more progressive area, like you're going to have to make some people uncomfortable. You're going to have to ruffle some feathers. Was that the best way to go about it? Probably not. It got him attention. Yeah. That's right. I mean, who knows? Maybe that was the only point of it. <laughs> I mean, in today's world where you almost – People become so fucking desensitized to so many things because of the internet um, and all this social media crap that, I mean, you actually need to have something pretty significant to to shock people into reality. Yeah. So. A fan of uh, punk rock, you know, that guy like literally spit in people's faces to to make a statement, but. I don't know. It comes off kind of pretentious at the same time, too. I don't. None of it's like a justification or is, a, is he right or is he wrong? It's just, no. you know, it was it was a strange <laughs> it was a strange thing to see. And it kind of got me thinking about that. Plus, watching the menu is like how much justification of quote unquote art is there? I know you haven't seen the movie, but there is a scene where you know, a cook shoots themselves in the dining room and the diners are like, Oh, it's just part of the theater. I mean, they're literally saying like a chef could literally get away with murder as long as it's on the menu. I thought that was a very funny, but thought provoking thing. God. And it's also so fucking sad at the same time. Yeah. I mean, because at that point, like, the movie, everything that I'm hearing so far is, and the reason I haven't watched it is honestly I've been avoiding like all those shows because it's I, I can't stand the sensationalized versions of what's going on in the kitchen, um, and you know like the bear I watched a few episodes and it was good, um, you know I got it and but then I was like you know what. I lived that life for the last 20 years. I don't need to fucking watch it. Yeah. Um, I watched the first episode of the bear right after I had gotten home from work. Why would you do that? I was, it was like, I was right back at work. Like it was Uh perfect. No, absolutely. I mean, I'd been out of the industry for a year and man, it brought back all the feelings, all the emotions. And I was just like, Oh God, like, I don't want to go through this again. Um, And not in a bad way, right? But I was just like, no, I mean, that's, I've lived it. I I don't understand it, which, I mean, this is a whole nother show is talking about that and people's reactions to it. Um, 
because when we start talking art versus sustenance, like now we're also talking the types of restaurants, right? Because you're going to have your restaurant, which is, uh, I mean, it's just fuel, right? Food is fuel. Um, and you know, and then you're going to have restaurants that kind of are in that middle world between fine dining and fuel, right? Where, you know, they're putting a little more give a shit into the food, right? There's, it's a little bit more plating, but they probably don't have the fine dining budget. Um, they didn't have, uh, the fine dining clientele. And so there's adjustments they've got to make. Sure. They want to be creative and artistic and, but it's all within that realm of uh, what is feasible for that time. And what's the guest can accept. Yeah. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, it still has to be good. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and I've never been, <clears throat> I've never lived in that world of the art food is art and not food. Um, you know, I, I've always poked sh- uh, fun at the tweezer chefs. Um, and I know I do that at their expense, um, but there's, it's a different world that, um, and I've just never been a part of it. And I understand parts of it for them, but it just, it's never made sense to me. Um, because it goes against a lot of what I've known about food. It's like, yeah. you're, you're taking too damn, if you need tweezers, you are taking too long to get that plate out. I've done way too much volume cooking to be like, okay, hold on. I'm going to put, I need tweezers to put the garnish on. Yeah. It's like uh, two yeah. different places where they would kind of utilize this tweezers a lot more. And it was a very weird feeling. <laughs> I mean, once you get into the groove of it and like, yeah, this is something that they do. So they want you to do it too. Yeah, it's fine. But coming from a background where you, you didn't own, even own a set of tweezers, it was, it was strange. But now you kind of, you get to like it. I don't know, and I mean, honestly, like, and I get it in, I mean, tweezers are, God, I mean, they're just variations on chopsticks and chopsticks were probably the earliest known forms of cooking uh, utensils. I mean, chopsticks weren't eating utensils. They were cooking utensils that eventually became eating utensils. Yeah. So they've just been Americanized by putting a little hinge on the back (laughs) I want to know the first person that started using tweezers, like went through his girlfriend's fucking cosmetics and shit. <laughs> yeah, I'll let that sink in for a minute. Yeah. So, but I mean, the the two different worlds, and where where my mind is going on this art versus the sustenance is, I, I kind of want to focus on the art a little bit because one, it's. I understand it, um, but you the art is a much more that fine dining world, and you know Noma is closing at the end of this season. They put it out there because it's like, hey, this is just no longer sustainable for us. Um, and and then in uh, Bon Appetit recently, there was an article that it was uh, fine dining is dead or something like that or dying, and, and I'm glad. You know, and I was like, I was part of it. And, and I'm just, I, I read it and I was pissed off reading it. <laughs> and, and because the person that wrote it, yes, they actually, they would worked, um, you know, probably at the, the laundry or something. Um, and, and a lot of what they talk about, like, listen, there's a lot of people out there. We all suffer from various physical conditions. Some do, some don't. That's the way it's always been. And, you know, in over periods of time, stress catches up with the body, right? Yeah. How do we handle certain things? Um, you know, how well do, do we take care of ourselves outside of the restaurant? Those are all pretty significant factors. And so if we don't take care of ourselves outside the restaurant, we can't put all the blame on the restaurant. 
We can't put all the blame on the industry. Um, and, but I was just kind of annoyed because it, it seemed like it, some of this arrogance of, you know, calling out like, you know, they were talking about the bear and how it brought out all the, the hostile work environments of kitchens. And I was like, that's not a fucking hostile work environment. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was intense. There's a lot of stress. I mean, and, and what I, what got me is like, listen, if we all do this for the love, right? It's a passion. It's part of us. It's in our blood. As much as we want to say it is, it, it's the only thing we know. And, and because it is part of us and part of that as well is also understanding that we are cooking for somebody else. We're, yeah. we're not doing this for ourselves. I mean, to a degree, but we're doing it to make other people happy. We're doing this for the clientele, for the guest, right? And if it's not for them and they're not coming in, then we can't get paid. So no matter what the pay rate is, you can argue that all day long, but it doesn't matter if people aren't coming in. <clears throat> and, but there is this element of like, it, it's stress because every time a ticket comes in, there's a timer that starts. And if you don't have that sense of urgency, that sense of, I got to get on it. I can't get behind, you know, that is own. It, it's an internal stress, right? Yeah. You feel it. The person next to you feels it. I, I, I mean, all of a sudden everybody's feeling it. Right. And then all of a sudden the machine starts going and it doesn't stop. <laughs> it literally doesn't stop. Right. And everybody's just looking at it. Like I'm going to rip that thing out of the fucking wall. And that doesn't mean, I mean, does that mean it's a hostile work environment? Because now you've got a inanimate object that's creating stress for you because people are coming in the door. I mean, because now at that point, everybody's stress levels are high. Yeah. Right. There's communication in the kitchen that's happening. Hey, I need this work or that. Hey, you know, why are we lagging on over here? You know, one station starting to fall behind. So that causes more pressure on other people. Like, so where's the, where's the hostility? Yeah. And that's, I mean, I get it. I've been there where I've had, you know, <laughs> a, long, a long thing because I think before COVID, like most people didn't give a shit. Restaurants were just restaurants and no one cared. But for some reason, COVID happened and then a bunch of people left the industry and it started opening up this wound. And people were like, oh, there's, you know, these are hostile work environments. But they're not hostile necessarily. They are stressful because we put a lot of stress on ourselves to do a good job. Yes. We are a fucking lot. Most of us. <laughs> if you want to be a professional cook or a chef, like you have to invest yourself a lot to to move to the next stage in, in your career. And if you don't, I mean, that's cool. If it's just a paycheck, that's cool for you too. But I mean, you have to pull your own weight too. Yeah. And I mean, that's pretty much, you know, of all, many of the times where I've lost my shit, um, you've been there for some where it's just dealing with people that didn't give a shit. Right. Yeah. And they were just blatantly like, fuck you. I don't care. And it's like, no, I've got way too much invested in this for yeah. you to fuck this up for everybody else and me. Um, whether it was the front of the house or the back of the house. But, you know, and I know we're kind of getting a little bit off tangent here, but I think it, it's all relevant to the conversation of art versus sustenance. Yeah, for sure. Um, so. Art moves a little bit of a slower pace, so to speak, I would assume. I mean, um, because you've got more tension on each plate, but that doesn't mean that stress has gone away either, though. Yeah. And going back to Noma closing, um, you know, I was never under any pretense that I was ever going to eat at Noma. <laughs> like... I yeah. never bought a book. Like I like Rene Redzepi. I bought the fermentation book. That helped me you know, a lot. But I mean, for the past almost 20 years, Rene Redzepi has 
been making people think differently about food. He's been a huge inspiration. But now, the same media outlets that were calling him a culinary demigod 10 years ago are fucking demon. crucifying him. Yeah, they're crucifying him for having unpaid stages and interns. Every place has unpaid stages and interns, and you can criticize that system all you want, but at the at the end of the day, they volunteered to be there. Yeah. They to join us. It's not like Rene Redzepi went and gathered village children and turned them into slaves. <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, and especially at a place like Noma, if you're going to go across, like from America to Copenhagen and stage for a year for free, you either have some rich ass parents or you did something really right in your life to have that kind of financial freedom. So I don't get where all this like thing about the unpaid stages and the interns. If he no, and I mean, honestly, like there's. No, I, I, there was a lot of unpaid interns and stages. Um, I mean, to me, it's like one of the same intern and stage, um, yeah. which that was just, that was because the, it wasn't because they were, they weren't actively recruiting for that either. I, you know, that's the one part that nobody talks about. Yeah. People came to them and said, I'm, I want to work. I want the experience. I, I, you know, I just, I, I want to be a part of this. Right. Yeah. And, and so they created that spot for these people. Now, even then at a, there's a certain point where there's just too much. Right. Um, but then you're always going to have that one, maybe more that is bitter about the fact that they weren't like in full production. Like all I sat there and just made like, I don't know, cucumber roses or something, you know? And it's like, well, it's kind of doing your, doing your part. Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I, I don't know what to say about that, but um, because I've never been in that spot. Yeah. But that's the same thing. Did you allow yourself to be the victim? Um, was, was that the only task you were given? Because maybe you got there and went shut the fuck up and nobody wanted to deal with you. Yeah. I mean, but yet, so now you're bitter about it and you're telling everybody and all of a sudden it becomes a news article. Ah, fuck you, man. And because we live in a, you know, we live in an age where everybody's opinion is now validated because of social media. Yeah. And you have thousands upon thousands of people attacking Rene Redzepi, who has like, he's openly come out and said, yeah, I was a dick. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. But you have thousands. Well, they have nothing to do with the restaurant industry. They're just coming up and bitching and bitching about it. And it's it's but, upsetting because, like, yes, this is a hard industry, but you don't understand, like, the love and the camaraderie that comes with it. And they don't touch on that in any of these shows either. Like, the bear, there's a little bit, you know, how they're all, like, pretty close. But, like, really, like, for the past 10 years, the best friends that I have are from work. I don't hang out with anybody that's not in the restaurant industry. I don't even know how that outside life works. <laughs> it's, like it's it's too far out there for me. And I think that happens to a lot of restaurant people and it kind of be, it's not elitist. No, not at all. And I mean, I, I just, I don't think outside people get it. No, they don't. And they don't understand you, you know, for the longest time, I just, I never had friends outside the restaurants either. Um, honestly, the only reason I've got friends outside the restaurant now is just, you know, my wife. <laughs> um, and, but that's the thing. Like they just, they don't understand me. Right. And I can't, there's, there's nothing that there, we have no relation, right? There's nothing that there's no common ground in so many things. You know, they've got <laughs> what I've laughed about, you know, real jobs with the air quotes. Right. Um, and they just don't get it um, and they never will. And so it's one of those. Uh, there's nothing about there's not. Yeah. The comic ground. I beat that one there. But so, you know, I know we're talking about Red Zeppi here. And 
and the interns and all this stuff. And there's a couple things that come to mind is I feel for the guy, right? Because he has done so much for this industry. Um, and he's grown it quite a bit and just created so much attention. And I mean, uh, uh, his organization mad, right? Um, you know, and there's so much, almost like on the political side of things that, that he is for that nobody ever talks about. Yeah. Um, and, and all that takes money. So sometimes, yeah, that someone's going to be unpaid. Um, but because they volunteered for it, right? Like we've already covered that. Yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden he starts just getting fucking skewered and dealing with people bitching, whether it was from the media, his staff, the, you know, who knows, maybe it's this, the next generation of staff coming in and, and it's almost to the point where I feel like he's closing, not because he's saying it's unsustainable to continue this model of paying everybody and, but still charging $500 a person for a dinner um, without any kind of wine or anything. Right. So, and so, I mean, you're easily talking about a thousand dollars a person. I mean, just once you're there yeah. um, and, and have like 60 cooks or something executing that plus your chefs. And I, I mean, that, that takes a lot to, execute at that level. And yeah. I honestly think that he's wrapping it up just because the love has been taken out of it for him. Cool. You know, where it's just because he's, he's like, you know what, we're, we're going to finish off the season, which just pretty much says we're going to finish off the reservations on deck and then yeah. fuck y'all. I'm going to go play in my kitchen and have fun again because you obviously don't appreciate it. Um, and then the other part that nobody, I have, I don't want to say nobody, but I haven't heard anyone talk about, right. Is where did Red Zeppi learn so much of this? El Bulli. Mm -hmm. Fran Andrea. Yes. I'm pretty sure I'm going to go out on a limb here <laughs> and say it was the exact same model. Yeah. And yeah, that was, but El Bulli closed like 15 years ago and that was before i started really paying much attention to like you know fine dining restaurants like that but i would be willing to bet that when ferran audria said that he was going to pack up shop everyone was just like at a loss you know there's a huge loss to the culinary world and no one was out there screaming at him or berating him for having an unpaid stage in his kitchen if it wasn't for him, like, dude, I mean, you can go down the list of people that would not exist. I mean, okay, fine. There are people that exist. Okay, let's not get into that fucking whatever millennial just got pissed off at me. But as a chef, right? Jose yeah. Andreas. Massimo. Yeah. Right? Red Zeppi. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's three people right there. That are all products of Fran Andrea. I would say products, but he he par he he parved he passed he carved the path. That was fucking hard, right? And and he created like this world that chefs of that mindset all of a sudden just took off and yeah. and allowed them to to really grow and um. And he pretty much said, hey, you know what? This is okay. You can execute this. You can do this. And, and it, but if it wasn't for him, like that, we'll just call it ultra fine dining, if you will. I, I, there's no way to exist. Yeah. And because of what he did, I mean, like all the, what do you call it, the hydrocolloids mm -hmm. that, that everyone basically uses now xanthan gum and agar agar like it's all for on he did all of that and to produce another chef like jose andres who's like he's taking his fame as a chef and turned it into 
uh, what they called the World Kitchen, mm-hmm. World Central he, Kitchen, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. He travels the world, feeding people in you know areas that are war torn or have had natural disasters. Like that's a pretty big fucking deal, man. Oh, you know what though? You know what really sucks? We we better get media involved in this. Everybody that goes out there and works for Jose Andreas at the World Central Kitchen. Yeah, they don't get paid. <laughs> yeah, I, who do we call You're for that? Great. Is there is that like the UN? Who do we bitch to about someone going in and feeding millions of people in? Uh, you know, after their country's been completely devastated and they've got they just need the help. How how do we get them paid? I think it would be the UN. Yeah. Would it? Okay. International thing. Yeah. There should be a number, just an 800 number out there. It just says, hey, 1-800, fucking nobody cares. Mm. No, but to me, that's almost like the same thing, right? And, and honestly, if I was in a different situation, I didn't have younger kids, uh, you, the amount of times would I would have volunteered to go out and, and cook um, just because I've got the ability. Why wouldn't I? And I've got no expectation of what I would or wouldn't be doing. Yeah, at that point, you're just, hey, you know what? You're a fucking mule. Yeah. You you get off the plane and say, what can I do? Right. But that's the same mentality that I would have taken into any of those other stage places. Yeah. Wherever I went. What do you need help with? What, what can what, I do? How do? Because that's how you learn. Whatever it is, it is a, you know, a learning moment. And appreciate being there. Yeah. It gets hard sometimes, you know, everyone gets burned out after a little while, but, um, a lot of that is perspective and, you know, you have to fight with that too, as a chef or as a career cook, like there's going to be moments where you're just like, fuck this. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Uh, But yeah, you really got to kind of take a step back and be like, you know what, this is where I wanted to be. I'm here. I'm learning. So is it really that bad? But that's another. Well, but I mean, it's the world we live in. And I've said that many times, you know, every person I've interviewed, I've asked that same question because I know we've all been there. Yes. Right. And if you tell me you haven't been there, you're lying. Um, because we've all just been in that spot where we just get home at the end of a shift. You may have fucking sliced your hand open or something. And you're just kind of. And you are just physically and mentally just done. And you just look at yourself and you're like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> like, you know, and it could just be after like a couple days of just getting your shit kicked in. And you're just like, there's got to be something better. And you know what? The grass isn't greener. Yeah. You know. And, and I say that we ask ourselves that question all the time because it's just the life we live. Mm. But who's to say someone in another life, right? That they're the lawyers or the jobs that we think are the greener grass, right? Who's to say they're, I mean, I I know they're asking themselves the same question, Mm -hmm. right? So, but it's still something I love. Yeah. And yeah. It's those like, you kind of go through little waves, I think. It's like something like that. Like after having three or four days of just getting like absolutely crushed, sometimes you need something to kind of just give you a little break, a day off or, or whatever it is, and then you're right back at it because you love it. There is nothing else you would rather do. And I don't think a lot of people understand that either. It's like the stressful situations and the hostile environments, I mean, it's just part of the it's part of it. It's not a negative thing. Like we thrive off that. We live off that. That's, it's that's fuel for us. Yeah. Well, and maybe we're. I was gonna say, these, I guess, but I mean. Yeah, I was gonna say too. Like the other part, I think it's more addicted to doing a good job. Like after you have a a service, whether it was like okay, if you have a bad service, it's a bad feeling. But after a flawless service, that high that you get. 
it can't be any different than a lawyer winning a case or you know a director finishing a film or something like that. It's got to be along those lines. Yeah. It's just a job done. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I was kind of laughing where uh, you'll understand this and some people were like staying at home was more work in more more hostile <laughs> than uh <laughs> I hope my wife doesn't listen to this one uh in mm-hmm. more hostile than than staying home I'd rather go to work you know and because yeah. it, it didn't matter what was going to happen at work I just I was in control I I mean and I I mean I I've, I've got an amazing wife and kids so I'm not saying anything negative about them um, but there's no rest and relaxation at home. And there's yeah. all, because as a chef, like when you're home, um, and you've got kids, like you don't get rest. You're not allowed to rest because you've been gone a lot. Yeah. Um, and so that's the hard part, you know, um, God, like when the kids would be in school, that would be the best thing ever. Um, but chances are I don't, I'd be at work. Mm. Um, <laughs> so yeah sometimes home was more hostile than you know hostile being not physically I didn't feel endangered or I didn't feel like what the hell I'm leaving this place I'm not going to pay for this shit um, but it was just mentally it was harder to be home than it was to be at work been there many times <laughs> fuck you I'm going to work <laughs> It's your day off. Nah, they just called me. <laughs> nah, they need me. Um, oh, somebody just called off. I gotta go. Yeah. So, how does this all tie into art versus sustenance? I told you, man. It was the broad scope. Like where we start and where we end up. Don't really know. One thing I was going to bring up about Noma, which I thought... I didn't really think about before, but it was kind of interesting was that, um, you know, he took that look of war thing and he took it like to a whole nother level. And while Noma might be one of the most expensive restaurants there is, or was as far as like a per person average, they don't really use any, um, luxury ingredients, which has been Mm -hmm. such a safety net for a lot of fine dining kitchens for such a long time that that's one of the things that kind of was really special about Rene Rizzepi and Noma. And, you know, that's not a shot at anybody. I mean, Thomas Keller serves fucking caviar and foie gras in his restaurants. I mean, that's, it's, it's part of the luxury that comes with fine dining. And now I will never say ever a bad word about Thomas Keller. I fucking love that guy. But, it gives you a whole new way of thinking when it comes to ingredients versus technique. Uh, I went out to eat with my wife not that long ago. We went to a restaurant um, that had just been like raved about, right? We ordered damn near everything on the menu. And the best dishes were dishes that were just ingredient driven and not technique driven. And it became kind of depressing. You you could put enough uni and caviar to make anything taste good. Where's the, where's the technique? That's an interesting concept there. Yeah. If you like Mm. foie gras, do pretty much anything with foie gras. Just don't fuck it up. But I mean that it is what it is. There's nothing any more. There's nothing special about it here than at a different place. It's still just foie gras. But you take somebody like Rene Redzepi who can serve you a plate of fucking moss and make it taste amazing for pretty much the same price point. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I, I didn't I didn't put those two together. Mm-hmm. Um, because you're right. Because so much of that fine dining out here is and and I'm just once again this is a broad paint stroke here. Um is about just you know the the Japanese wagyu caviar 
you know, foie, regardless of how you feel about it. Um, Bucking truffles. <laughs> truffles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> lobster. Lobsters. Oh. I don't know why people still eat that. The fucking cockroaches. Um, I don't understand truffles. I uh-uh. get it. No, I mean, I, I've I've been in that spot where I, I was at a restaurant in Dallas, and it was, hey, if we want to be at this level, I'm like, then we need to be. We need to play this game too. So, uh, the white Italian owl with truffles came available, and I bought a pound for two grand. Yeah, and and I think I was selling it. I think we it was like a forty dollar upcharge, and we just go out there and shave it at the table. I, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't understand. No, nah, don't get it. Uh, to me, that, it didn't do anything that, for me. It doesn't really add anything special. No. But that's part of the fine dining world, right? It's the exclusivity. It's, uh, and I think like the the article you were talking about. That's why people want fine dining to die is because of the, it's like its own little microcosm of inequality. You mean it's elitist? Yes. Like in this, <sighs> charge five hundred dollars a person. And this other restaurant only charged, you know, 50. Well, there's a lot of shit that goes into that, that you can't really just lump it into categories like that. No. But I'm telling you, the people, and fine dining has had this criticism, you know, forever, at least in America, I think, where if you're going somewhere specifically for luxury and you can afford it, how can you justify that to yourself when there's, you know, restaurants that are just as good if not better down the street at a fraction of the price point that are suffering because no one wants to eat there no one knows about it they don't have the same marketing team and the same big name chef and and the same wine list and things like that but it it's not an easy answer you know, there's nothing that you can say that's going to fix the situation where you know it's a thousand dollar tasting menu here and a hundred dollar tab over here. It's just part of what goes into it. But when you take away those luxury ingredients, like I was saying, can you still charge that goddamn much? Yeah, you can. I think that's what another was a big deal when, um, 11 Madison park decided to go vegan. When you take away the safety net of all those luxury ingredients and you have a, a restaurant like 11 Madison Park, do you know how fucking like insanely creative you have to be to make an all-vegan tasting menu and still charge the same price point? Who is that? Uh, I, I'm going blank. The the French chef that did that. Um, uh, Lane Ducasse, I think, was the yeah, one. That, yeah, 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 yeah. And like overnight. Yeah, I mean, three Michelin stars uh, and just overnight we're going vegan. And everybody was like, the fuck you are. And I mean, <laughs> this was. God, 20 years ago, it was, yeah, it was a while ago. Um, And all of a sudden, everybody's like, well, what about your stars? Is, is, are they going to keep your stars? I mean, are they going to take them? Like, what's going to happen? And it's like, why? Just because he's not serving, you know, uh, the duck press anymore, or the foie and all that stuff like everything takes the same amount of attention and in a lot of ways, vegetables to become that star of the show almost need a little bit more attention Yeah, uh, because they're not as forgiving. No. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you kind of, you had that head turn like, Hmm. Um, yeah, but still, I, I, I mean, I appreciate it because at that point too is, you know, you're, 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 for me to go to 11 Madison, it's now more of a commitment to go for the art um, and 
I appreciate a hundred percent of what's going on there. Um, but there's also other places where, I mean, yeah, I'd love to go and have, I don't know, like what, when, when they were still doing meats and stuff and the, they're pretty iconic for their duck. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's just me though. That's like, where's my protein, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and can they put enough in a, in a way animal fats or not animal fats, but you know, animal fats are, are what kind of create that fullness in a lot of people. Right. Mm. So when it's just being vegan only, I mean, are you going to finish off a 20 course meal and then being like, Hey, let's go grab a burger at Shake Shack right next door. I mean, at that point, you're right. You have to be more committed to the art than the sustenance. Hypothetically. I'm sure they've figured out a way to make you full from 20 courses of vegetables. But, um, oh, shit. Right I mean, you've already finished digesting your first course by the time you got to <laughs> 10. So, I mean, that mentality is not, you know, that's not just going to be you. That's going to be a lot of people. Yeah. No, I, I mean, that's, you know, that, but that's the mentality of <clears throat> I'm paying to, to feel satisfied like almost physically as well as like, but you know, your soul satisfying, right. Is everybody needs a level of physical satisfaction when you're going out to eat, right. Your body's got to feel, but I mean, there's plenty of other vegans out there that'll argue that like, um, I don't know. I, it's just never been a diet that I've chosen to go down. So I, uh, I have a hard time with that one. Yeah, I try to do mostly vegetarian at home um, just because it makes me feel better. Eating a lot of vegetables makes me feel better than eating a lot of meat. It just does. And you do have to be a little more creative. But I can't go vegan, man. I love butter and eggs too much. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, no, I mean, and but what about your kids? Do they eat that same? They, uh, they'll try anything, but it's kind of a 50, 50 <laughs> and like my, uh, my youngest, he loves like soups, like vegetable soups. Don't know why he just likes the texture of it, I guess. But, and then my other one's a little more picky, but, uh, they'll try it. At least they're open to trying things. Now you're, you're somewhat lucky. <laughs> I say somewhat because. No, I've I've got my son that fuck. <laughs> fuck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you just can't tell with him sometimes. Um what he'll eat and what he won't eat. Um and but at the end of the day he's just a straight carnivore. Um, and then you got my daughter that'll eat like Tom Ka soup. Um but other stuff is gross to her. You know, uh, she'll do over easy eggs on toast. Loves it, right? Tom Cobb, but like, try to feed her anything else. Fucking gross. She'll make a face and I was just, all you can think of is like, you'll eat this, but not this. I mean, how is this? I, I wish I had a better example, you know, but it's like, I mean, very safe food. And they're like, no, that's gross. <laughs> no, it's not. This is uh this is called entry level right here. This the yeah. other stuff you eat is considered gross by a lot of people. So well they don't appreciate the art, do they? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'll tell you right now, my, my kids don't appreciate the art or the sustenance. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed um, episode one of the new format. Um, next week we're going to be talking about, uh, we get into my history of kind of where, I don't want to say my resume, but just kind of uh, where I started and my progress through my culinary career. Um, and then the, we'll be following that up with Morris and his growth, where he came from. Uh, we've got two very different worlds that we came from. 
two very different paths, but in a lot of ways, we kind of met right there in the middle. So uh, look forward to those episodes coming up. Uh, we're going to be recording those over the next week or so. Um, that's it. So thank you again. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget, leave a five-star review. Um, if you don't like this and you don't want to leave a five-star review, don't leave a review at all. Um, five stars help us with quite a bit. Um, if you're able to write out a quick review as well, even better. Um, and make sure you follow us um, on your podcasting platform of choice. That way you get alerted whenever a new podcast episode comes out, especially with our new formatting. Um, we might be seeing more throughout the week. Thank you again for listening. Don't forget to like us, follow us, share us. Till next time.